Hello everyone, welcome to the Game Design Perspective. I'm Santi, I'm a senior game designer in the video game industry. And today I want to do a little bit of a review slash deep dive on a game called Kunitsugami Path of the Gods. This is a small budget Capcom game that mixes the tower defense genre with Capcom's action pedigree to create an incredibly unique game. The game works in which you have to guide the titular goddess from the beginning of a village to the end, to a gate, to purify such village from a curse. During the day, you have to gather resources, rescue villagers that will help you fight, and guide the goddess. And during the night, you have to fight demons to defend the goddess with strategy and action. As such, it sounds pretty simple, but the reality is that it's truly not. So let's get to the review. Let's get into the deep dive. The positives are the core level loop is fantastic. It's brilliantly implemented. It's against time to gather resources, rescue villagers, set up traps in these beautiful dioramas and with a very snappy, simple character controller that makes it a joy to navigate the world. The animation work of Suo is a masterpiece. And so the day is this race against time until the night comes and it becomes an incredibly strategy action game. But it's not the traditional action game. It does not feel that way. And the reason is because all animations are deliberate. The whole combat is deliberate. There is no animation cancel. And animations are long. There are some animations that are four or five attacks, one after the other, in which you cannot get out of the animation. And that alone, in a vacuum, sounds like a bad thing. But in this game, in this implementation, it feels great. And as I was saying, Suo's animation is master. Class, especially while fighting because the fighting is based on traditional Japanese dancing so it just feels about like you dancing around demons and ghosts protecting the goddess and it just looks and feels spectacular and as such the level design flows masterfully with each other it's set up in little contained dioramas that you have to explore to get resources and it just feels great to navigate and they're gorgeous the the team actually scanned realistic assets to do this and it shows. The enemy design in general is incredible. So every single enemy has kind of like there is a normal enemy that is the grunt, but even the grunt has unique gimmicks uh, depending on its size, for example, how they attack, how they move, it changes, right? So even the grunt has its gimmicks, but there's so many enemy types that they're introducing new enemy types all the way to almost the end of the game. And they all feel unique and they all change the battlefield. They do unique things. They can capture the goddess herself. You know, they can control your village the simple act of flying makes combat incredibly different, you know? They, and there's usually will have a counter in the villages. So there's a strategy there on what you bring to every mission. And then as such, the bosses. Every boss has an incredible gimmick that makes the level design, the environment they are, important. There is a specific boss fight that takes in a, almost a whole village. It's like a spider. I'm sorry for the spoiler. It's a little bit of a spoiler because it's a later boss, but I think it's worth mentioning. The level design of these boss fights specifically, that is along a whole village, makes it that you have to use your villages effectively to defend the goddess, while you have to actually separate and chase the spider to actually win the fight. And there is a sense of tension that is not created with just a difficult fight. It is amazing. The bosses alone are worth the game. Of course, the art style is amazing. The Japanese aesthetic is marvelous here. The particle effects are actually photographed from actual real particle effects and they look incredible. Not to demerit that, but I find even more captivating the story and its minimalistic approach of telling this story. Because what you're experiencing in Kunitsugami, it's a myth of creation. It's a myth of the story of how the village and the mountain came to be. And it's done without dialogue. It's very beautiful. It's not traditional storytelling. It's more like a myth that is passed down from generation to generation. It's an origin of this village. It's, it's very charming. It's surprisingly deep. It's very emotional. I think they did a great job. Those are the goods. And the goods alone, I hope they sell the game but the game is not perfect. I think the team was obsessed with the dioramas and with the player exploring and interacting with the dioramas. And as such, they made something that is I find incredibly frustrating. They tie the dioramas to the progression. So if you're gonna make a repetitive task, you have to make it as efficient as possible for the player's sake. The more cumbersome you make this task, the more it weighs on the player's experience and the more frustration that player will have. Well, it seems that they didn't care. They 
they made the decision that in order to upgrade Suo and the villagers, you have to fix the villages themselves. But you, in order to fix them, you have to go to a specific point, fix that point, wait a certain amount of time for that point to be fixed, and then go and touch that point again to mark it as fixed. If it's just one village, it's not bad. But there's like a dozen of them. And you have to go inside of them, then go out, select the next one, and then do it again and again, going into the, each village just to upgrade and just to get more resources to upgrade your villagers and so on. So it's not really fun to upgrade. It's actually quite tedious. I think there must have been a more creative or entertaining way to, to explore these villages. Instead of forcing me to fix them to upgrade, it could have been just a menu. I just feel that way. Finally, this is, this is probably the only only gripe I have with the game. If it had a menu to upgrade, it would have been close to perfect. But there's one little thing uh, that I also didn't like, and that's the name itself. I think the name Kunitsugami is very difficult to market. I know I'm talking about market, but just hear me out. Even with its quirks and its progression, it's fantastic. I wouldn't want to change it. They, they had an uncompromising vision. I understand. That's fine. The game's name actually harmed it in promotion. When you're trying to recommend a, a game to someone else, the game Kunitsugami doesn't stick because it's foreign. It would stick in Japan, but the moment you don't speak Japanese, and I'm saying from myself that I studied Japanese, Kunitsugami just doesn't stick. It's hard to recommend. And I wish to recommend this game. I, I I just keep thinking, why, how would this game market with a different game that is more approachable? Maybe just the path of the goddess. It might have worked, right? I just think it's difficult to market. And these things matter. And why does this matter? It's because I really hope this game is successful. Finally, what I learned as a designer with this game. So every game I play, I try to grasp things, no matter how good or bad the game is, I try to grasp things, lessons that this game shows us. And what I learned is repetition, even if optional, really needs to optimize for the player. That progression system really hurt. But I also learned that simple character controllers that are snappy can be better than very complex animation-driven characters. What do I mean? Nowadays, we have an obsession with making our character controllers have weight and distribution and moving one way or another. In root motion, is there like proper vector of updating? You know, having like animation blending and weight, you know, and leaning. And there's a lot of things that has made our animation systems really complex. Kunitsugami is like the way you move is just move forward, run, that's it. And it feels great because it's snappy and it's more focused on giving you a fun, tight experience than having a very realistic looking one. And I sometimes need to be reminded of this, to be honest, because I tend to be very picky with my character controllers and I look at it really deeply and how they lean, how they update their head movement, how they update their, their feet, inverse kinematics and many other things, you know, because I studied for this and I have done it professionally. But this game actually brought me back to a time when I just focused on the gameplay and the importance of gameplay. And I am glad this game did that. So so thank you, Kunitsugami. Uh, the other thing is that your level design, you can extract a lot more of it if you move your objective. So what do I mean? The goddess moves from point A to point B. And as such, your purpose in the level changes as she moves. This is a thing with tower defense games. It's not, nothing new. But again, this game reminded me of this, especially with the masterful layout design of the dioramas. Because the way they flow, enemies will come from different directions depending on which day you are in or which position the goddess is. So traps that you place one day do not work on the next. So you need to constantly adapt. You need to constantly keep evolving, you and your villagers need to be constantly changing strategy and be, to be efficient. And that just extracts so much of the layouts of the levels. They just feel great because setting a correct path on the correct day is amazing. But you need to remember that that won't work the next day if you want to finish amazing just the level of design alone is a master class and that's what i learned i think finally i want to talk about kunitsugami's position in the industry this game brings me back to a time when japan could pitch anything and I'm talking the PlayStation 2, Nintendo, GameCube, and original Xbox, the beginning of the 2000s. At that time, Japan was able to literally get greenlit whatever they wanted. 
publishers were giving money, small amounts of money, to efficient teams just to create the weirdest experiences. You know, some of them are still popular today, like Yakuza, if you think about it, comes from that era. And that's a weird game. Fantastic one, but weird. Right? But we can go even weirder. You know, if you look for Katamari Damachi, that's a weird, strange game that if nowadays you try to pitch it, or if the West, even back then, if the West tried to pitch that game, you would be laughed at. To know just how weird Japanese games could get, and then even translate it, just look for Mr. Mosquito for the PlayStation, and you'll see how weird things were. But they're very creative and very freeing, and people were like just pitching whatever they could. There is an arcade that is just about flipping tables that comes from that time, and it's a, literally a table that you flip. That's what these games brings me back to. And this is an era that is remembered fondly by the whole industry, from the most very better person I've met, and I've met really better people, to the most junior. We all talk about this time, about like a golden era where games were just pitched to be fun, and there was not this concern of monetization or budgets, or because budgets weren't as big anymore. And there was a very important aspect of that time was that there was no AAA tag. And because there was no AAA tag, there was no consumer distinction between an indie and AAA game. And that was a very freeing environment to create really strange stuff like this game. This is Capcom putting a game out there with an uncompromising vision, with a small team that feels that was designed back in the PlayStation 2 era, just to be weird and give a very specific experience. And this is Capcom taking a risk on that type of game. During the time that we needed the most, what happened with Concord recently, with these live service, incredibly huge budget games that are just failing to meet expectations from Final Fantasy, Star Wars Outlaws, these games are failing in big budgets and they are not, as much as I love Final Fantasy River, it's not feeling exactly unique. It's feeling great with a great combat system, but it's not feeling unique. This feels unique. This feels strange. This feels small, but powerful. This feels like that era. So if this game succeeds, we are sending all a message to Capcom and to the whole industry that is like, we need creativity back. We need this uncompromising, weird, not sometimes safest, but also smaller budget games that are not just like indies putting stuff out there. You know, we need the bigger publishers to have their pipelines, their technology, because this game was made with RE Engine. We need these bigger publishers to put their technology, their pipelines, their experience in also these types of games. And if this game like Kunitsugami succeeds, that's the message we are sending. And as such, I think that Kunitsugami is Capcom's most important day a game right now. Give it a chance. I'm Santi. This is the Game Design Perspective. Have a good one.